everyone. Welcome to Crop Hour. Uh, so today we're going to be uh, moving on with day two, uh, discussing sunflower uh, insect pests, a couple of them that are of particular importance. My name is Patrick Wagner. I'm the entomology field specialist based out in Rapid City. And our speaker today is Dr. Adam Varenhorst. He's our extension entomology specialist based in Brookings. And today, Adam's going to be uh, discussing uh, the red sunflower seed weevil and Decti stem borer uh, here in South Dakota. Uh, as the um, intro slides there, they were kind of discussing. If you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A feature um, or just type stuff into the chat and we will address those questions at the end of the talk. So Adam, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, uh, we can go ahead and get going. Looks good. And I All right. That, so I'll turn it over to you, Adam. All right. Thanks, Pat. Well, good morning, everyone. And as the title indicates, we're going to be uh, really just speaking on two pests today. Uh, the red sunflower seed weevils are by far the most economically damaging insect pest we have in sunflowers right now in South Dakota, and followed up pretty closely by the Dectes stem borer, uh, just depending on the year, the location, and the state. Uh, just seems like it's a pest, though, that's been persisting for qu uh, quite a while now, and there's factors that may or may not in encourage that. So. We'll get started, though, talking a little bit about the red sunflower seed weevils. And one of the things we need to know about all of our sunflower insect pests that we could talk about is that they're annual pests. So sunflower is native to the United States, and so are these insect pests. As a result, we don't have resistance built up in our sunflower genetics towards these insects. That's partly because of the fact that most of the breeding was done in other countries where they don't have these insects. And so as a result, we have some of these insects like the red sunflower seed weevil that can be a problem every single year in sunflower production. And, and within the United States, most states will have them, but the uh, amount of damage they cause kind of varies as well as the populations. And in South Dakota, we've been having very, very large and severe populations. In these really large uh, populations, when they infest a field, they can cause yield losses from 50 to 80 percent. Now, the larvae themselves, which are feeding on the kernel inside the sunflower seed, will not consume the entire seed, but they will feed on enough of it that there's damage and uh, for oil seeds, that reduces weight and oil content. Uh, for confection sunflowers, nobody wants to bite into a sunflower seed that's already been fed on by an insect. And so uh, a lot of times if you get a rotten or partial seed, uh, when you crack one open or uh, look at the seeds, it's probably due to red sunflower seed weevil. In South Dakota, we primarily manage these using foliar insecticides. And a lot of times it takes two applications of insecticides to reduce the populations. And as I mentioned, we've had very large populations that can probably safely update our 10 to 100 times over the threshold now to 10 to 1,000 times over the threshold uh, based on some fields we saw in 2022. But the threshold for these in oilseed sunflowers is four to six weevils per head, an average of four to six weevils per head throughout the field. And it's one uh, adult per head in confection seed uh, sunflowers. And so you can imagine those are very low thresholds for an insect that I'm saying has very large populations in our state. Now we add on to this issue the fact that since 2017, we've had reported field failures for insecticide applications. And so the initial field failure reports were for Lambda Cyhalothrin, a pyrethroid active ingredient. And since then, we've added to our list esfenvalerate. And uh, last year, I believe a lot of people were trying to test anything they could, use any products that they hadn't used before that are labeled. And we are finding out some of those didn't work as well either. And we'll talk about why that might be an issue as we move forward. But the big thing is, is we have large populations in South Dakota, and it doesn't seem like the insecticides we typically would use for management are working. 
And when I say we could probably update it to a thousand times uh, the threshold, uh, this this picture right here is kind of highlighting. This was what a field population uh, in one of the locations we were sampling looked like in 2022. Now, typically the red sunflower seed weevils will be on the face of the sunflower head. However, on this plant, we see that they're on the ray petals, they're on the bracts, they're on the stem, they're on the leaves. This is an indication of a very, very large population present because there's so many, they can't all fit where they would normally be uh, hanging out. If we look at this, this is the face of that same plant. We see that it's literally covered. And something important to remember is that uh, these florets here uh, are actually, they're, they're not right at the surface. They kind of extend and the weevils can actually kind of worm their way down in towards the actual surface of the face. And so if we see this many up on the top of the florets, there's probably that many more that we can't see. And so uh, easy estimation here is that there's a few thousand uh, sunflower weevils on this head. And just to kind of drive this home, uh, we collected some heads from that field. And this is what the bucket looked like. So there's three heads from that field. And uh, Philip Roseboom, my IPM coordinator, said that on the drive back, he could hardly stand it because it sounded like a drone of uh, flying in the back in the bucket. And so uh, these are very, very large populations, and we typically won't see these. Uh, historically, a large population is three to 400 uh, weevils per head, and uh, we're far exceeding that. Now, if we go forward, I said we have field failures, but when we've done sprays in the past, we can come back later in the season. We do see that we killed, we killed the weevils. Uh, as evidenced here, there's dead weevils uh, remaining on the back of the head weeks after the applications. But kind of the, the main thing, though, is that there are some weevils, even after we spray, that are still happily moving around. Now, those could be coming in from another field, or they could just not have died after the insecticide application. So uh, right now, we have 29 insecticides labeled for red sunflower seed weevil management in South Dakota. I believe this number's actually gone down uh, with our most updated pest management guide, which is on extension.sd state right now. The big issue we have after that 2021 decision on chlorpyrifos and revoking the food tolerances is that every one of those currently labeled products is a pyrethroid active ingredient. And of these 29, the vast majority are actually just lambda cyhalothrin or lambda cyhalothrin with another active ingredient. And in some cases, that other active ingredient isn't even labeled for red sunflower seed weevils. So it likely has no impact on their populations. And I mentioned we had our first report of a field failure in 2017 for lambda cyhalothrin. And if we look here, you can see that it's occurred every single year since. And these aren't just what we're observing. These are actual stakeholders, farmers, uh, sprayers reporting that they're uh, applications went on and had no impact on the population. In more recent years, we've started to also get calls about field failure reports for esfenvalerate, another pyrethroid active ingredient. Now we started back in 2019. Uh, we've really changed our protocol from that initial year, but we've been looking for what we are referring to as reduced susceptibility. You could consider this to be pretty similar to resistance. The big difference is, is these first years, we didn't have a population that we knew was susceptible to the chemicals to compare to. And so we termed it reduced susceptibility because that way we weren't saying that it was resistance. It just in our state, things weren't responding the way we would expect. Now, the first time we really observed an issue as far as reduced susceptibility was in 2020 in our populations we were testing. And this has been increasing every year since. Uh, so in 2021, we saw it again, and some of the data, I think, will make it pretty clear we saw it in 2022. And another issue we're having is even though we have a lot of insecticide applications going out into the field, we still have these extremely large populations in South Dakota. They actually seem like they might be growing. And so this first experiment I'm going to go over for today I want to point out we had four treatments, and these were done uh, with these little glass vials. So they're 20 milliliter glass vials. The reason we use those is we can put a known amount of insecticide in. We run them on a hot dog roller so that they dry. 
but the hot dog roller doesn't have heat on, so it's not making it dry too fast or evaporating the chemical, but that rolling motion ensures that we have even coverage around the entire container. So we throw these weevils in to these treated vials, they're going to be exposed to the chemical. And in the lab setting, this is actually an ideal condition because it's a almost guaranteed coverage, and we don't have that in the field. But our treatments included acetone, which was actually used to ensure that the other chemicals dried on. Uh, so it was mixed with the chemicals. We had to make sure that the acetone by itself didn't kill the weevils after it had dried. But we had Warrior II, which is Lambda Cyhalothrin, Asana XL, which the active ingredient is Esfen Valerate. And then we are testing Asana XL plus Exponent. Exponent is a PBO or a Piperneal Butoxide Synergist. This can be used with quite a few other insecticides besides Asana. Asana historically has looked better in our experiments. So we put it with Exponent to see if we could get that really high level of mortality or death of the red sunflower seed weevils that we were hoping to see. We also tried this year seven, uh, which is the insecticide. It's also the active ingredient. So the name and the active ingredient are the same. Uh, it's not labeled for red sunflower seed weevil, but it's uh, somewhat related to chlorpyrifos. And we were hoping, well, chlorpyrifos looked like it worked pretty well in the past. Maybe seven could be an alternative for us. We stopped using it after our initial few locations because it performed so poorly. We weren't even killing 50% of our popu population we put into the vials typically. And so we determined that that's probably not something we want to test. And so for South Dakota, we also had populations collected in North Dakota, but for today's talk, we're just going to highlight the South Dakota populations because in North Dakota, they're not really seeing this issue. And so we collected at least a thousand red sunflower seed weevil adults from each field, and we collected from 28 fields uh, this year in South Dakota. And it's really important that we get out there right at the onset of flowering or a little before because we don't want to be sampling the populations after insecticides have gone on. Uh, the field, because as you can imagine, if we're sampling individuals that are still out in the field after they've been sprayed, there's a really good chance that they're already resistant and it would skew our results. So we placed 20 adults into the vials 24 hours after we collected them. And we liked that 24-hour uh, period so much that we actually used it again for when we reevaluated the weevils. So we checked them 24 hours after they had been put into the vials. And so this shows how we put the weevils into the vials. In the past, we actually did this by hand. Uh, we would use the forceps and grab each weevil, counting them, putting them into the vial. That would take hours. I had employees who were getting uh, arms that they couldn't move the next day, and we had more weevils to put in. So we started using a vacuum uh, pump. And so we tested before we did the experiment, because you can imagine it's a lot of uh, force pulling them into this little vial. Uh, we really wanted to make sure we weren't killing the weevils before the experiment started, but they were at, they were fine. This is used for other uh, insects as well for large experiments. And so it sped our process up. What would normally take four or five hours, we could get done in about 10 or 15 minutes, uh, which worked well because we were doing more locations this year. Uh, so to give you an idea, we do try to sample uh, a wider area each year we do this. Uh, the red indicates sampling sites for 2022, and I apologize if you start counting all the points. 28 won't show up because some of them are close together, and they actually are kind of masked. If I could zoom in uh, into some of these areas, you'd see them more. Uh, the other thing we have to do is wait uh, or go to fields that we can easily drive to, but uh, you can see the gold here represents 2021 sampling sites. We did spread out a little bit. Uh, as we move forward, we're hoping to sample some of these other areas uh, in the state where we know there are sunflowers being produced. Uh, also, just kind of, we know that there are some sunflowers uh, heading east a little bit. They're a little bit harder to find, though. Uh, Patrick, who's our moderator today, did all the sampling on the western side of the state, and you can see he did a very good job spreading out. Uh, so for the grass I'm going to show you for this study, on the y-axis over here will be corrected mortality. You'll notice I don't have my untreated control bar or our acetone technically bar. Uh, the reason for that is corrected mortality is calculated by using the mortality in the control to correct the other treatments. And the reason for that is the acetone shouldn't kill the insects by itself. 
And so if there's any death, it's likely due to just the fact that they're in a vial for 24 hours. And so we try to correct everything to that. When we go through, if there's an asterisk, that means that that treatment was significantly different from one. So the, the average for that treatment was different from one. One would mean that everything in the vial died. And so uh, we want to see that when we're looking at the insecticides. The red line here represents 90% mortality. And that's about what we probably would see in the field. And so if we're below that, we're below also what we'd see in the field. The reason for uh, not hitting 100% in the field, as I mentioned, the weevils can go down under those florets and kind of in between them. It makes coverage a lot harder, uh, a lot harder to get 100% coverage on the weevils. Uh, sometimes they may move and get exposed to the insecticide. Sometimes they may not. We, we can't guarantee 100% knockdown in the field. And so the red line is where we want to see the bars to at least be at because uh, in the lab, remember, they should have ideal coverage. So what I did for today's talk was I went through and I combined counties that we looked at. So for Potter County, we sampled three fields. I pulled that data together. And so what we see here is that for Asana by itself and Warrior Two, we had significant differences from one. So we would say that this was reduced susceptibility for those two treatments. What we saw when we added Asana with exponent and tested that, we actually got close to one. And it wasn't uh, it was no longer significantly different from one, which means that it actually worked. And that's somewhat the trend we saw at almost every field we looked at. The Asana with the exponent, so that synergist actually greatly improved mortality. So for Sully County, we had eight fields that were pooled together. The Asana. XL and the Warrior 2 were again significantly different from one. So we would say that these had reduced susceptibility. For Hughes County, we had seven fields that were pooled together. We get close to the 90% here with the Asan XL, but we're still significantly different from one. With the Warrior 2, we're again significantly different, different from one. So we would say that for Hughes County, the combined fields had reduced susceptibility. The asanum with exponent, again, looked very good. When we go to Hyde County, uh, we actually see that we had, uh, it was below the line, but not significant from one. So uh, there's evidence that, you know, maybe if we found a few more fields or uh, sampled another field in Hyde County, maybe we would find some evidence. But for the field we tested, the trend looks like Warrior 2 is not looking as great. The Asana is getting close to that 90%, but Asana plus exponent looked really good. It was actually right at one. For Buffalo County, we just had the one field. Again, Asana XL Warrior 2 didn't perform very well. We had reduced susceptibility there. And the trend continues where the Asana XL plus exponent looks really well. For Stanley County, we had three fields. And this is where it starts to get interesting because the Asana XL looked really poor. We are down a little bit below 60% mortality. The exponent with the Asana actually did improve the mortality, but you see that we're still far below that red line. We're significant from one, and the Warrior 2 is also significant for one. So this location is the first uh, that we had where every treatment looked poor, including the Asana with the exponent. So this is probably because of just how. Uh, this population was uh, not reacting really at all uh, to the insecticide. And even when we added that exponent, we, we couldn't jump the mortality up that much. And so uh, we'll talk about this a little bit, but in the lab, this was a pretty shocking result because everything else we looked at, uh, the combination looked wonderful. So when we go to Hawking County, uh, it's another one where we saw some evidence for decreased mortality for both Asana plus Warrior, but it wasn't significant. So uh, for now, uh, this population we'd say that we tested looked pretty good. The exponent with the Asana improved mortality. For Lyman County, just one location. And again, the Asana XL and the Warrior 2 uh, had evidence of reduced susceptibility. Asana with exponent looked great. For Bennett County, same thing. Asana and exponent looked wonderful. The Asana XL and the Warrior 2 had reduced susceptibility. 
Now, Pat, I've had him test uh, this, our West River Research Farm, which is right outside of Sturges about every year uh, because there aren't a lot of sunflower grown right around that uh, research farm. And it's been one of our better uh, susceptible populations over the years. However, we're starting to see a trend with Warrior Two, where the mortality is actually decreasing. And this is a surprise because we haven't applied insecticides at this location for the red sunflower seed weevil. Uh, but one of the things we don't know about this pest is how far they can travel from field to field. We know they can fly as adults, but we don't know how far within a summer an adult will move from where it emerged to where uh, it mates and lays eggs. So we're, we're not sure on that. Uh, chances are there's some other sunflowers in that area that are getting treated and they're slowly making their way to our uh, field site there where he's sampling. But uh, there is that trend that we're starting to observe there. For Pennington County, same as so many others, uh, we had the reduced susceptibility for Asana XL and Warrior II. The exponent in Asana looked really good. So I apologize, that's a lot of data to go through and uh, we went through it fairly quickly. So the conclusions from 2022 are that we had reduced susceptibility at a, almost all of the sites we looked at for Lambda Site Halothurn and Esfin Valerate. Uh, we had a few where things still looked positive. When we added the exponent in the lab, and there are other PBO synergists out there, uh, so we're not endorsing exponents, the one that we could get our hands on this year. When we added the exponent, we increased mortality around 10 to 15% when we compared to Asana XL alone. So that's pretty good. However, I have a little asterisk there, as you can see. And the reason for that is uh, there were some individuals who sprayed this out in the field. They used Asana with the exponent and they didn't see a very positive result. And I think if we think back to that, those three fields we had pooled together for Stanley County, that might be what we're seeing out in the field, where even though the Asana XL is improving mortality by 10 or 15%, when you're down in that 50 to 60% range, we're still not getting up to where we're really reducing those populations enough. And uh, I have it here that we've started testing, uh, we, the one product we tested, uh, we've been told probably won't be available for 2022, but we've been testing some different products uh, that aren't labeled for sunflower. They're newer products. We've seen some that look really positive. And so we're hoping that one of the directions we can move forward with is that we can start getting some of those products uh, as soon as the stocks are available, uh, emergency labeled for sunflower or uh, whatever we can do just to get another product out there because uh, you know, I mentioned that we right now we only have pyrethroid active ingredients, and that's not ideal. So let's kind of look at a summary of uh, last year compared to this year. So last year in South Dakota, we looked at 24 uh, locations. So for Lambda Cyhelothrin, we had 17 of 24 locations that had evidence of reduced susceptibility. This year we had 29 of 30. Uh, South or sorry, North Dakota actually came down and tested two locations, and I did show those in our graphs uh, because they uh, actually overlapped pretty closely with two of the locations we sampled. But of the sampled sites, uh, we did have a total of 30, but we had 29 of 30 locations in South Dakota this year that had evidence to reduce susceptibility to Lambda Cyhalothrin. The only one that didn't was out at the West River Research Farm in Meade County. <coughs> Excuse me. So then for Esfin Valerate, last year we had 11 of 24 locations. So we were, uh, you know, we we're starting to see some evidence of problems. This year we had 27 of 30 locations. And if we want to think about that a little bit easier as percentages, for Lambda Say we had 71% in 2021 of the fields that had reduced susceptibility. This year, we had 97%. So we had an increase. Um, same trend for us and Valerie. Last year, we had under 50% of the fields sampled. It was at 46%. This year, we were at 90%. And so, you know, I, I showed that graph, or sorry, the map with our, our sampling sites, because I wanted to also point out that, you know, there's, we've heard this in recent years where, well, the more you test or the more you sample, of course, you're going to see more of an issue. So each year we've been increasing our sampling sites uh, because we're trying to sample a larger area of the state. But we had 
not direct overlap, but we are pretty close uh, for, to last year to this year in many of our sampling sites. And we also had new areas. And so the fact that we're seeing this increase, I think, shows us that this is actually becoming more of a problem in South Dakota. So if these numbers had hung around, uh, you know, this year's numbers have been closer, I would say that, oh, it looks like, you know, the trend's holding. Uh, we do have a problem in South Dakota, but this looks like the problem's becoming worse. And it may get back to what we had just been, I had mentioned, where we don't know how far these weevils move uh, from season to season. Uh, the overwintering habit is that in the fall, the larvae essentially jump out of the plants. So they're feeding on that seed, plant starts to dry down, starts to cool off, they abandon ship. If you harvest early, we've seen evidence that the, they haven't jumped out early or on time. Uh, you can catch them while they're still in the seeds, and that can be a headache because then you have a bin full of uh, red sunflower seed weevil larvae. But ideally, they jump out into the field, they overwinter in the soil, they pupate in the spring, and then in the June area, they start to emerge sometime in June, typically later June, they start to emerge as adults. And so then they start seeking out sunflower fields. Uh, and so if we knew exactly how far they flew, we might have an idea how these populations are maybe spreading out, but we don't right now. Uh, I have this though, this is uh, kind of an interesting thing uh, because North Dakota, our sunflower production sites in South Dakota aren't that far from North Dakota's. North Dakota still has observed no signs of reduced susceptibility in their state. And so this for now seems like it's something we're dealing with in South Dakota. Uh, North Dakota hasn't seen a problem yet. And so uh, I mentioned we didn't have a susceptible population uh, during those first years. After we identified North Dakota as not having an issue, we decided to do an additional experiment. And the reason for this experiment is so that we can determine whether or not these populations are actually resistant to these uh, treatments. And so we had three chemical treatments. So it was the acetone control warrior two and Asan XL. And then these are the doses we had. And I highlighted, so the 13.35 and the 21.18 uh, micrograms per milliliter these are actually your standard rates. So the standard high rate for each of these chemicals, we consider that our 1x rate because we know we have a problem. Our recommendation would be to use the highest labeled rate for these products if you're going to use them. That breaks down, all of these doses breaks down to a 0.125 times, 0.25 times, half, one, two, and four times that high labeled rate of the chemical. We had to have at least five, so we went with six concentrations. And the reason for that is we wanted to be able to do what's referred to as a probit analysis. And that's where we can see uh, on a curve where it looks like our lethal concentration to kill 50% of the population is where it is for 90% of the population and 99% of the population. So everything else is pretty similar. We had to collect adults from the field. We put them into vials. Uh, 20 adults into vials 24 hours after collection, and then we looked at them 24 hours later. The big difference is, is a lot more vials, so we had to collect a lot more weevils. And as a result, we didn't sample as many fields because one of the things we had to have uh, in 2021, our populations were large, but it still took time because we're sampling earlier to get that many weevils. And so for Sonic Cell in 2021, over here is the insecticide dose in the micrograms per milliliter. I'd put the red line here because that roughly is where our 1x rate would be. And so the yellow bar here represents the lethal dose to kill 50% of the population. The blue bar represents the LD90, so the lethal dose to kill 90% of the population. And then the text above it represents the LD99. So how much how how what are what dose would we need to kill 99% of the population? Because that's what we'd really like to see. We'd like to kill as much of the population as possible. So North Dakota, I mentioned, extremely susceptible. We can't even see the LD50. The LD90 uh, barely registers, so it's under one. The LD99 for North Dakota is 5.13. When we go to Hughes County for a Sonic XL in 2021, we see that the LD50 is still fairly low. We're well below that 1x rate. The LD90, however, has creeped above the line. We're somewhere in that 40 range. 
for uh, micrograms per milliliter. So almost doubled, uh, not quite, but almost doubled our 1x rate to kill 90% of the population. As we see, to kill 99% of the population, we would need 253 micrograms per milliliter. Uh, so uh, that's a pretty big jump uh, from where we would expect to be. For Hyde County with the Asan XL, pretty similar is what we saw with Hughes. The LD90 is above the 1x rate. The LD99 is much higher in the same thing with Sully County, except that our LD90 in Sully County, where we first had our field failure reports for Asan XL, uh, is above 100 micrograms per milliliter, so five times uh, the 1x rate to kill 90% of the population. And then to kill 99% would take 579 micrograms. So another big jump for us. But nothing uh, of the locations for Sonic Cell had an LD50. So just to kill 50% of the population, that was close to uh, that 1x rate yet. When we look at a Sonic Cell for 2022, things are fairly similar. North Dakota, still very susceptible. Our Sturges Research Farm, the West River Research Farm, pretty susceptible. When we go to Dakota Lakes Research Farm, we haven't had a, reports for Esven Valerie uh, or Asonic cell failures in that location, but we did see that our uh, LD90 is actually just right above the 1x rate, and then our LD99 is far above it. For Hughes County, again, uh, we saw that we have a pretty big jump. The LD99 in 2020, or LD90, sorry, is actually higher than it was last year. These are different fields, but same county, and then the LD99 is extremely high. When we jump to Warrior 2, the 1x rate is lower, and so it's about, uh, if you remember, it's just a little above 10. North Dakota, again, is very susceptible. In Hughes County, our LD90 and LD99 are above that 1x rate. The LD50 is not. When we go to Hyde County, this is our first instance of where we actually have an LD50, so kill 50% of the population is above 1x. So the highest labeled rate will uh, in Hyde County will probably not kill from this data set 50% of the population. The LD90 and LD99 are extremely high. And for Sully County, we're just right on the line for Warrior 2 with the LD50, the LD90, and the LD99 are very high. When we look at 2022, uh, very similar to the Asan XL that we saw for 2022, North Dakota, the Sturges Research Farm, pretty susceptible populations. Dakota Lakes Research Farm, uh, the LD50 isn't quite there. The LD99 and the LD90 are well above the 1x rate. And then for Hughes County, the LD50 is well above the 1x rate. So uh, right here, that tells us that that's a very resistant population. And so we can simplify this a little bit, though, because I know you don't want to try to remember all of those graphs. And so what we can actually do is compare our populations at a site where we think that there might be resistance to where we know that they look extremely susceptible. So in this case, we use North Dakota and we calculate a resistance ratio. So we just divide our uh, resistant by our susceptible population there. If the resistance ratio is less than five, a population is considered susceptible. If that's in the range of five to five to 10, the population is moderately resistant. If it's greater than 10, this is highly resistant. And I pulled this from the WHO. So uh, this is what they would use for mosquitoes. They do a lot of work with mosquito susceptibility to chemi uh, different chemistries because it's important in a lot of countries to be able to wipe out a mosquito population because they're spreading disease. So as I mentioned, it's the test population divided by a known susceptible population. And so here are what those resistance ratios look like. So in 2021, for Hughes County, we had resistance ratios above 10. So remember, 10 is our highly resistant for Asana XL, Warrior 2. In Hyde County, again, we had it for both Asana and Warrior 2. In Sully County, for both. So in 2021 in South Dakota, each of the three sites we looked at had resistance ratios that indicated that we had highly resistant populations to the chemistries. Now, I will point out that the ratios are lower for the Asana compared to the Warrior 2, but Warrior 2 was uh, having reports for at least, uh, I believe, two years before we had our first Asana report. And so if you notice, you know, there's, there's obvious uh, indication of that because these are different. 
uh, when we go to 2022, our population at the Sturges Research Farm compared to North Dakota is moderately resistant. And that's because North Dakota is so susceptible. However, for when we're looking at this, you know, I did say that for Warrior Two in 2022, it looks like we're starting to see a decrease in the mortality. And so this, this is kind of highlighted here. Uh, for Dakota Lakes Research Farm, with the population we tested, they are still considered highly resistant. And then for Hughes County, highly resistant to both chemistries. And so takeaway here is we can finally stop saying that these populations have reduced susceptibility. In South Dakota, we have resistance to Asana XL, so the active ingredient S and Valerate, and Warrior II, the active ingredient Lambda Cyhalothrin. And so that's a big thing for us because, you know, as we move forward, uh, reduced susceptibilities uh, takes a lot more time than just to stay resistance. And also, once we confirm resistance, we know that we can uh, really push towards looking at some other chemistries. And as we looked at that data, I pointed out the resistance ratios are, are much higher for Warrior 2. And that's, again, it's likely due to the fact that we've been having this issue with Warrior 2 for a longer period of time. In South Dakota, uh, last year we fought very large red sunflower seed weevil populations. Looking at the winter, you know, they're down in the soil overwintering, uh, and we've had a pretty ideal winter. It hasn't been extremely cold. We've had snow cover in a lot of the parts of the state. And it, it'll probably be another year where we have very large red sunflower seed weevil populations. One of the interesting things we observed last year is that I had a lot of calls about resistance showing up in fields. And as we talked longer and longer on these calls, it became clear that it wasn't actually resistance that's being observed because they sprayed and these populations are still out in the field. In 2022, we had a somewhat unusual emergence period for these weevils because Fields were getting sprayed at the R5 point, you know, right when we were hitting R5. And then about a week or two later, we had these populations showing up into the field that were just huge. Uh, they, they they just blew away those initial populations, were, which were above threshold. Uh, but, you know, we're going from 10 to 20 weevils per head at threshold during that first spray to, you know, a few thousand. And so... One of the things I want to point out is if it's resistance, you would expect to still see about the same number you had counted pre and post spray. If you see a dramatic increase, that means that you have populations moving into that field that you didn't have before. Now, it's still not ideal because you're going to need to treat again. And so we're going to need to try to scout a little bit more going into 2022 to make sure we're catching those population, the large population when it's moving into the field, if it does that again. And we don't know why this happened. There's many factors. Uh, the spring may have influenced the emergence period. Uh, it's also possible that as we start to have more of these populations that are resistant, it may be an adaptation that was uh, part of this resistance. Uh, maybe it's a... Uh, it's just an effect of the populations that are developing resistance maybe show up to the fields a little bit later. We, we don't have any hard evidence though. Uh, we're just theorizing at this point. And, you know, as we move in uh, to the next year, unfortunately we we're somewhat stuck in South Dakota because if we can get some products, we have uh, a field trial that I'm not going to show here today where we saw some promising results for some different chemicals not registered in sunflower. They are registered in South Dakota for other crops though. If we can get emergency labeling for those done uh, before uh, end of July and August, that'd be great. Uh, we're hoping to get that done. So uh, otherwise we're going to be stuck again with just having the option of pyrethroid insecticides. The big issue with continuing to use just pyrethroid insecticides is there's this term called cross resistance. And where we already have two chemistries within the pyrethroid class that are uh, having resistance, uh, the red sunflower seed weevils have resistance towards it, it's it's possible that we have resistance in red sunflower seed weevil populations than to all pyrethroids if there's cross resistance occurring. So that's something we're going to be testing here as we move into 2023. Uh, we're going to be doing, we're changing our glass vial assay a little bit. We want to test the remaining pyrethroid chemistries and see what we're seeing there. If it looks like it's resistant to everything, some of these chemistries do not get used uh, 
for red sunflower seed weevil management. So if we start to see evidence that there's a problem across the board, it's probably cross resistance, and that pretty much knocks out every chemistry that's currently labeled. So uh, we will have to, I think, see as we move into the future, we have to see more chemistries get labeled for sunflowers and specifically for red sunflower seed weevil management. And so things I can tell you from uh, this year and previous years, if you're going to have to manage, we know you're going to have to manage red, red sunflower seed weevils, avoid Warrior II and Asan XL. We have evidence that there's resistance towards these. Also from our evidence, even if we would, uh, and we won't do it, but don't, don't go off label, don't use seven. It doesn't work well. And don't use Mustang Max. So Zeta Zypermethrin is the active ingredient of Mustang Max. It is labeled for red sunflower seed weevils. We tested it in the past and it looked, it looked really poor. Uh, we typically didn't get above 60% mortality. And so uh, we never tested this for resistance, but based on what we are seeing, uh, we can pretty much say that it's not going to be a, a good option. In the lab, the PBO synergists look like they could be a solution to some degree. Uh, if you're looking at a chemistry that's in the past worked well for you and you want to make sure you, you have that high level of mortality, problem is, is these synergists are not cheap. Uh, they're actually relatively expensive. And we're looking at about a 10 to 15% increase in mortality. And in the field, as I mentioned, in some cases, uh, we are told these did not work very well. And so once we get, we tested these with almost every chemistry labeled for sunflower right now in the field. Once we get that field data uh, finalized here, hopefully within February still, we'll put out some uh, information on our South Dakota State Extension site on what those results look like. But the big thing is, is that, you know, we we aren't going to completely recommend using this because it is expensive. And uh, if, if your populations are at that 50 to 60% mark, we can't guarantee you're going to really knock a lot of them down. And so another thing to think about, is I said, we have in some cases, thousands of weevils per head. If we can kill 90% of a thousand weevils, we're still above our, our threshold for both confection and oilseed sunflower. And so those populations would still need to get sprayed. Now add in what we're seeing with this resistance where we are maybe only knocking out 50% of the population at best. And you can start to see that, you know, we, we have this compounded problem of large populations resistance it's just going to continue to be hard to knock the populations down. So we need something else uh, probably to help us along the way. And so we're looking at these alternatives. As I mentioned, we're working on those Section 18. Uh, we will be working on Section 18s for some different chemistries that look promising. Uh, the one in the lab, probably we, we discussed it with the company. They said that there probably won't be stocks available for 2023, but hopefully in the future. Another thing we might need to think about is altering planting date. And I, I'm always hesitant to mention uh, alterations to the planting date because I know spring's a busy time and you're already, you know, your time crunch. You have other crops to get in the ground besides just sunflower. But there's a study in North Dakota done in the 1980s and it demonstrated that planting date is a very effective tool for reducing red sunflower seed weevil damage. Planting earlier, that is. Uh, and so... We were curious this year, we ran a preliminary study to see if the results would be the same in South Dakota because it's been almost 40 years and different state and they didn't have the weevil pressure that we do right now. And so we tested two varieties. Uh, they're both fairly early varieties, but uh, there's also a third added into the loop because we had three planting dates at Dakota Lakes Research Farm. The farm manager, Sam Ireland there, had planted right next to us with uh, another variety, but he got in 11 days before our first planting date because we were, as I mentioned, spring's busy. We were planting other crops right then uh, over on the far eastern side of the state, so we couldn't get out right away. But uh, we had effectively four planting dates at the Dakota Lakes Research Farm, May 16th through June 17th. And so we don't have the data yet, but Patrick also did this at the Sturgis farm, similar setup for dates. And so uh, for our results, we're just going to be looking at the Dakota Lakes one. So this is that May 16th planting date. And this is a different variety, but 
uh, that I think you'll see the trend here. So what we're looking at here is for discoloration of our, our seed. And so these are actually sunflower seeds. You can see that outline. They're still, they haven't been opened. So if we see discoloration, that means that it was red sunflower seed we will damage. And it's, that's what we typically would see with them. It's just the partial discoloration. So May 16th had 1% damage. When we go to May 27th, we had 23% damage. So 11 days, we saw a 22% increase in damage to the seeds. You can see there's a lot more discoloration present. For June 3rd, we jumped to 51% damage. And June 17th, we had 96% damage. And so the trend here is that the later you plant, the higher damage you're going to have to your seeds. And we did not spray these. So these were left unsprayed. And so those really early planting dates had much uh, lower damage compared to the later planting date. And so that matches really well with what they saw in North Dakota 40 years ago. And so uh, our recommendation is that sunflowers in South Dakota should be planted as early as possible in 2023. And please don't chase me out of the state if we have a wet spring and you can't get in and you try to put sunflowers in and miss uh, getting other crops in on time. Uh, this is for you know this weevil management. As I said, we're kind of up against the wall here. Uh, our chemistries aren't working very well. And this is something that might be able to help us until we get some other chemistries on the table. Ideally, we would be planting sometime or before May 16th because uh, Sam put those sunflowers in, it looked like they had much lower uh, damage compared to as we planted later. Uh, we don't have the exact target date that'll get you the best management while also ensuring that you uh, have you know reduced pest pressure. Because one of the other issues we have with planting date is later planting dates are recommended for some of our other pests. And so we will be watching very closely. We didn't see any evidence of it in our study this year but we will be watching very closely as we move forward with this. Uh, we're going to continue this next year, uh, as, or, sorry, this year in 2023, uh, but it's something we have to be aware of. And one of those potential insect pests that may be causing us a headache uh, later in the season if we plant earlier would be Dectes stem borer. And so the adults are these gray beetles with very long antenna. It's the larvae we really worry about. They're going to be down in the stems. They're going to be burrowing around and it's not actually that activity that we worry about. So that's associated with minimal yield loss. They girdle the stalk at the end of the year. So I cut this, but this is essentially what they would do. So there's the larva there. They go down to about the base of the stalk and they'll feed around it. And that activity weakens the stalk. So that's girdling. And then if we get any wind, the plant will tip over. The reason they do this is they actually overwinter below that point. And then they want to have it so it's really easy to emerge in the spring. They don't want to, as adults, to have to chew through all this material. Uh, so they want the plant to be tipped over so they can just go through uh, the hole they made. They plug it up uh, with some some of the, as you can see, a lot. there's a lot of waste caused by them. They plug up their little hole at the base of the plant that they created, and then they overwinter. They want to just be able to chew through that and not have to go through a whole plant. One of the things we can do with Decti stem borer is use lower planting populations. They're kind of lazy. They want to have smaller stems uh, for the plants that they're in because they can only feed out from the center where they're feeding at. They can only feed out about half an inch. If your stalk has a larger diameter, they can't feed all the way out. They get tired. And so you also have to think they don't have, they don't have legs. So they're doing a lot of work pushing themselves and then going around feeding. Uh, the bigger the stem, they're just going to wear out uh, and they're not going to cause that extreme girdling. As a result, there won't be as much lodging. And lodging is the big issue with this pest. Now, they prefer slender stems. They girdle a little sooner when it's dry. And we have slender stems. We have uh, extensive lodging. It typically occurs earlier. I don't have my drought monitor map in, but there's a chance we could be dry again in 2023. Uh, right now, most of the state's in some degree of drought. And, uh, you know, we just got some precipitation in some areas of the state last night. But, you know, I'm not the meteorologist or the state climatologist. I can't tell you if it's going to be enough uh, as we and if we're going to get more. But dry conditions can cause headaches with these. So for management for Dectes, lower planting populations work well. You know you have an infestation. We recommend prompt harvest. 
There's evidence in the southern United States where they grow sunflowers that planting later can actually reduce Dectes infestations. However, there's no data from North or South Dakota. North Dakota tried to do a study of quite a few years ago. They didn't have the Dectes populations they needed to get any clear results. So uh, we're planning to put a study in though uh, where we have planting dates uh, where it'll be separate from the Weevil project because we wanna make sure we don't have any uh, sampling overlap within the same plots because for Dectes, we have to split the stems. So it's destructive, but we want to see if we can affect Dectes in South Dakota planting date. And so we'll be testing that in 2023. Right now, there's no evidence that planting later is going to be beneficial to us. Another thing that's recommended for Dectes is using later maturing hybrids. And again, please don't chase me out of the state. Uh, the reason for that is that the longer the stem's green, the reduced risk you have of Dectes causing lodging. I would stick with lower planting populations probably though. Uh, and I was looking through, we don't have a lot of hybrids available that are really late. There's maybe one or two I could track down yesterday when I was looking through. Uh, the big thing with later maturing hybrids though, if, it, if the seed, the head's still wet and you still have a lot of sap, can't harvest, longer you have to wait to harvest in the fall, you all know increases the risk of blackbird feeding, which can be a problem of themselves. So they can be pretty severe if you have a large population moving through. And we see that when we do the survey, some fields get really hit really hard before harvest, even in South Dakota. And so it's another thing to think about. And ultimately sunflowers have a lot of things to consider when you're trying to manage all of the different pests. Another issue, uh, some samples that were sent in to us got sent to North Dakota and then uh, North Dakota sent them to Kansas because uh, kind of the expert on Decti stem borers down in Kansas, uh, he's worked with them for a very long time. He right away identified that the larvae probably weren't actually even Dectes, but were another species uh, that will potentially uh, infest sunflower. They have a very similar behavior to Dectes, but their larvae are a little bit bigger. Uh, still not causing yield loss just from themselves. But uh, so he he thought that there's probably this other species. And then there was some feeding down at the base of the, uh, through the root crown uh, and out. And he had no idea what would have caused that. And this is somebody that's been working with Sunflower for uh, their entire career. They're towards, uh, uh, he's close probably to retirement at this point. I know a few years ago, he was joking that he was going to retire. Uh, but you know, that's kind of a surprise for us here in South Dakota. We have something that an expert had no idea what might have caused that feeding. And so we're we're hoping to do a survey here in 2023 of sunflower. Uh, the National Sunflower Association will be having their uh, biennial survey. They do it every two years. Uh, we'll be doing that, but we also want to sample additional fields and get an idea how much is actually Dectes, how much is that Ataxia hubbardi. Uh, and then we're going to be trying to look and see if we can find the insect responsible for feeding through the root. And so uh, it'll be a pretty time intensive uh, project. And, you know, looking at this uh, 2023 season, it looks like we're probably going to be pretty busy uh, just in sunflowers and we have other crops as well. I want to thank the National Sunflower Association as well as South Dakota Oil Seeds Council. They have funded uh, our work on the red sunflower seed weevil since we identified that there was a problem in South Dakota. And they've been very supportive of us. So here's some information for all of you that are watching. And if you need to get a hold of me, here's my office number as well as my email. I have mentioned on other crop hours that I am on uh, parental leave right now until uh, the first or second week of March kind of falls in between there. And uh, so if you need to get a hold of me, I will not be answering my office number until that time. And if it's an emergency, please send me an email. In the summer, I do post information on the Twitter account. Uh, I typically reserve that for the summer. It's uh, for updates. Uh, insects that we're seeing, if we're at threshold or if it's an insect that we need to really be watching for because it can be problematic and it's showing up in the state, that's where I typically put that information in addition to extension articles that are sent out through our pest and crop newsletter, but they're also on extension.sdstate.edu. So that is all the information I have for you all today. Thank you again for your attention. I'll turn things over to Pat.